How many of you like to win? Anybody like to win? How many of you ever play to lose? Anybody out there plays to lose? I don't know about you, but when I play, when I fight, I fight to win. How many of you know that you were created in God's image and He promised that you'd be the head and not the tail? He said you'd be above only and not beneath. Now sometimes we might feel beneath. We might actually feel like we're behind. But actually, you know, when you are, when it appears, everyone say appears. When things appear like you're lagging behind or losing a battle, actually God is actually setting you up to propel you and launch you forward. Because all things work together for good. Amen? If you love God, and I, I really pray that uh, <clears throat> you hear what the word of the Lord came through John's uh, stance in this morning. In fact, uh, you know, John, as you were ministering prophetically today, I, <clears throat> I had to check my spirit because I said, oh no. It's one of those oh no, mo- oh no moments when the Lord shifts gears at the last second and says, you will not preach again what I asked you to speak or what you studied. And I said, Lord, don't do that again, please. And uh, John confirmed in his word what I'm going to be sharing today. This is not a word that I'm prepared for. And I don't know why, but that's just the way it works. Uh, Sometimes when we are being spirit-filled means we want to be led by the Holy Spirit and not just by a prepared program. Uh, And I'll tell you why. It's because God loves to speak a word. In, In Hebrews 3 it says today. Everyone say today. Today if you will hear his voice, do not resist or harden your hearts. Okay, don't, don't reject or resist it. And the reason why he says that is because usually the word that God wants to speak to our hearts is outside the boundaries or outside our understanding or maybe outside the parameters of what we would reason God to work within. Uh, we, we actually have a natural framework that we kind of feel comfortable in and sometimes God will take us outside of that zone. Amen? And uh, let me give you an example. Abraham and Sarah, they were uh, in their latter years, 75 years of age. She was younger. And they were both barren. And God speaks to him and he says, Abraham, get out of the place where you're at. Get away from your family, your tribe, your culture, your kindred, and to a place that I will show you. Now, how many of you know that he was an idol worshiper in Earl Chaldees? He was a Babylonian idol worshiper, and God tells him, okay, it's time to move. Everyone say, it's time to move. <laughs> See, God, when, when we're obeying God, you're always moving. There are three things about any believer. You're either moving forward, or you're stuck, or you're going backwards. A lot of amens on that one. You're either moving forward or you're stuck or you're going backwards. And that you may say, well, Pastor, I, I don't receive that word. No, no, it's not intended to be. Ca- How many of you know it's good to examine, Paul says in the Corinthians, to examine yourself whether you are in the faith. Faith takes you higher. Faith moves you. It advances you. Faith always tells you to move forward and to take out giants. And uh, when when John was sharing this morning, um, the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart about some things that I'm going to stick with that, uh, what the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. I want to pray. And before I do pray, I want to let everybody know tomorrow night we have Monday night prayer. And I pray that you'll come out for Monday night prayer. And do you know that in the midst of two or three. Two or three can literally establish a momentum that becomes the barometer of where a church will go. And it's prayer. When we're in one accord in one place, there's something about prayer. So I pray for that also. I want to let everyone know on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the last week of October, we are going to be calling a church fast in prayer. This is one week before the elections. We're calling a fasting and prayer as a church. How many of you believe our nation needs lots of prayer? And we, there's a lot of things at stake that are far beyond the political agenda and the uh, right, left wing, independent. 
There's, there's far more at stake going on here than just what you see on the news. So we really need to understand, <clears throat> and we need to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Amen? Because God doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to advance. And he wants you to take out the giants. He wants you to realize that you're, you're not going anywhere as long as you continually live in looking in the rear view mirror. We've got to stop looking in the mirror and looking at what people did to us and the problems and the trauma of my past. It's time to crush the rear view mirror, take a hold of the promise, and begin to move forward in the kingdom. Jesus, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 that the Lord takes no pleasure in the soul that draws back. God takes no pleasure in a person who doubts and has unbelief. And I, I pray today that we will begin to move forward. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we pray right now that as we go into the Word, Lord, it's not just a, another word. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to just begin to tear down and break every chain, break every bondage. We come against the spirit of fear. Any lie that would bind our hearts, that would just hold us in a savage slavery to something in our own past or in, our, in any particular area of our life. Lord, we ask you right now that as the Holy Spirit would come down with his finger and he would begin to speak to areas of our heart, Lord, that might even be hidden, Lord, so that you can heal and restore. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? <clears throat> Many of you believe God always restores. The Bible says if a brother or a sister be overtaken in any fault or sin. Let me say it again. If any man or brother be overtaken in any fault or sin. You which are spiritual. Everyone say Spiritual. Now what does that mean? Spiritual doesn't mean religious. It doesn't mean you're a churchgoer. To be spiritual means there is a level of maturity in your walk with God. To be spiritual means that you are more God-like than Adam-like. When you're God-like, you always see the image of Jesus in a man or a woman instead of their Adamic, fallen, broken, bad nature. You which are spiritual, restore. In the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest ye be overtaken in the same fault. So, guess what? There's no excuse. There is no excuse that God levies to us that says, well, I, I'm going to just hold on to that offense. And I, I felt what John was saying today that <clears throat> I want you to jump with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. I believe that not only is what John said, remember what he said, Satan is coming with a frontal assault, or what the Spirit of the Lord was that this... The enemy is coming with a frontal assault to attack head on. Now what does that mean? That seems like a very generic statement. But when Satan comes in like a flood, when the enemy comes in like a flood, what is the number one attempt of the enemy to seeking to do in your life? What would the devil like to do to any believer? What does he come? Jesus said it, and you know it, John 10.10. 10, Satan comes but to kill steal, and destroy. Destroy what? What's he after? Your wealth? Yeah, well, you, you beat me to the punch. <laughs> he's after your faith. He, he's not after your wealth or your health. He's, he's not after just those things. He's not after your job. He wants to destroy and put a wall between you and God. If he can get people bitter, if he can get them to a point where they begin to isolate and withdraw. If he can get you to stay around friends. Let me tell you something. Do you know that some of the worst, well this is sad to say, do you know that some of the greatest enemies to your progress will be your friends? Whoa, 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 whoa. what do you mean by that? Do you know that 
Sometimes your friends or even family can keep you from forward progress. Let me tell you what the world's definition of a friend is. The world's definition of a friend is tolerance. The world's definition of a friend is let's don't rock the boat between us. The world's definition of a friend is I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and by the way, you leave well enough alone, and I'll we'll leave well enough alone in your life, and let's just have a great time together. Let's party like an animal. But you know what? Sometimes those friends can keep you from the call of God. Sometimes people that you might think, even family. Do you know when my wife and I several years ago was making a decision to come to Dallas, it wasn't my enemies. It was my closest friends and even some family that said, what in the world are you going to Texas for? Why would you ever want to go down to that God-forsaken hot place and live? There's no mountains in Texas. That's what my family used to say. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going because God, God's calling me. Yeah, right. Give me another one. I mean it. That's, that's not all my family. I shouldn't say that if it goes out. I love all my family, by the way. But sometimes some of my friends start challenging Carol and I on some of those things because we were launching out. When you begin to launch out into the things of the Holy Spirit, launch out into the things of God, there will be those that are close to you that will say, what in the world are you doing? They'll isolate you. They'll begin to question. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happens is that we begin to uh, make our journey. We, get, we came down here, and uh, <clears throat> we bought a house over here off of Sahara Road and in our backyard. My wife and I had a backyard, and we had this big construction shed. How many of you know what a construction shed looks like? It's, it's 12 feet by 24. They come in different dimensions. But this construction shed had two huge wooden girders under it that was called a sled. It was literally brought in by dra a tractor dragging it in. It didn't have wheels. It, it was on literal wooden girders that over the years had rotted. Dry rot had come in. And do you know what that building did? That 20, 12 foot wide by 24 foot long building literally broke in half because the ends of the beams had rotted out so the building, when it settled, it broke in half like this. It was, it was about 10-inch wide gap. Now, you know what yours truly did? Kind of a real stupid thing. This is what yours truly did. I needed lawn equipment. I needed a lawnmower. I needed a weed eater. I needed a chainsaw. I needed some other utensils. <clears throat> and I went and I bought those things, and this is what I did. I locked the door of the shed while I left a 10-inch wide gap in the side of the wall open. Not very smart. I don't know, maybe some of you are not catching the picture here. How many of you ever locked the door only to leave a window open? Not a smart move. But, but this time, there was a crack. I mean, you, a man could go through this. I was robbed not once, not twice, but three times. I got my lawnmower stolen, and the third time... An embarrassing truth, truth story. My wife is here to witness. I had just hopped out of our upstairs master bedroom shower. I opened the window to let some steam out of the uh, bathroom. And while I opened the window, I saw a man coming through the crack of the wall. And he had a weed eater in one hand. And he had a hedger in the other. And he was scrambling down took a right down the alleyway toward Shiloh. Yours truly, without thinking, ran downstairs and Carol says, where are you going, Ray? I'm going to catch the guy. You have nothing on. That's true story. I, 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 was, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I just wanted to get the guy. I was running in the buff, but I was going to get the guy. But thank God for a wife who stopped me in my track because I've been robbed three times. And you know what? I, after going through this whole mess, I got taken. 
I've been ripped off three times all because I am so lazy. All because I let this thing ride. And I let the enemy come in and rip me off because I failed to make repairs on the building. And to top it all off, the third time, because I had all these appliances stolen out of my shed, I went to the insurance company. It was right over here. I can't remember the guys. I won't, shouldn't mention it. But the, the insurance company, I went in and said, I want to make a claim. I've been ripped off again. And he said, Mr. Galligan, sorry. Ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. I said, why not? I, I've never... And by the way, that's the first time on the third... On the third time I got ripped off, it's the first time we actually made a claim against our homeowner's insurance. So I went over to the guy and says, I'm sorry. And I said, look, I've been living here for several years. I've never staked the, had a claim against our policy yet. And you say, denied. And I was in shock. Oh, by the way, I wasn't in shock. I was angry. I was mad. And I remember coming home and I, I, I said, Carol, look for another insurance company. I'm done with that guy. I am done with him. I was moving on. Well, guess what? Overnight, that actual insurance company, no, it wasn't that night. It was the next, maybe next two or three nights. The next two or three nights, the insurance company gets robbed. And about 13, 12, 13, 14 of all their desktop computers and PCs got stolen. Well, this is what happens. The secretary to the agent calls me up and says, Mr. Galligan, can you come in right away? I said, okay. He says, the agent wants to talk to you right away. So I go in, and now, by the way, some of you may not know this, and by the way, I, I don't put a lot of hedge, and I never use this on people. I would never do this. I don't pull out the God card or the pastor's card because I got robbed, okay? I don't do that. Some people do. I don't do that. That's to me, is, is a lie, and it's hypocrisy and everything else. It's just, it's just wrong. But I get called by the secretary, and when I go over there, she has me sit down in the She's she, uh, in the, the chairs, and I'm waiting for the agent to call me and talk to me. And she says, wow, he wants to see you. And I said, what happened? We just got robbed last night, and he knows you're a preacher. And he thinks that God's out to get him, so he's going to okay your policy. True story. He okayed the policy and gave us everything we wanted. We were able to replace it. No, I'm not telling. My wife is here to witness that. Now, I did not, there was no arm twisting. I didn't come and say, well, do you know that the reason why you were robbed because you defy the armies of the living God? I, I, would ne I hope none of you ever do that to people. That's just wrong. Now, I know why some Christians and some preachers, I heard one preacher uh, years ago get off, if you don't give to this ministry, the Lord told me he's going to take me home. That's so bad. That's just wrong. It's, it's, really, it's really bad. You don't go threatening people. If you don't tithe, man, the Lord said, it's this week on me. Now, some of you might rejoice. Praise God, new pastor. Hallelujah. But, you know, those, those kind of things are just crazy. But, but I remember going through, sweating this out, and the Lord really began to show me two things. First of all, he'll take care of you. But, but even if the insurance company di didn't give me the, uh, the money to replace the, the uh, lawn and garden and equipment, the Lord was teaching me to trust him. But secondly, there was a bigger lesson here, was that I let things lapse. I let things go in my life. I want you to see a story in the book of 2 Chronicles 15. As, as John was prophesying, the Lord gave me this word. And it, this is one of the kings of Judah. There were 18 kings in Israel, 8 king, kings in Judah. The, the kingdom was divided because of the idolatry of Solomon. The Bible says the nation of Israel was split in half. But Azariah, this prophet, 
had come to Asa, who was the king of Judah. Listen to what it says. And he went out to meet Asa, who's the king. <clears throat> and he said, Hear me, Asa. And, and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. The Lord is with you while you're with him. Now what he's referring here, now we know that the Lord's with us all the time, but he's referring to the blessing of God. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, what does it say? He'll forsake you. Wait a minute, Jesus, Paul, Je, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. That's Old Testament, isn't it? Yeah, it is Old, Old, Covenant, Old Testament. How many of you also read in the, in, the, in the Bible where it says that if we draw nigh to him, what does it say? Well, my question is, where was he then? Why do I have to draw nigh to him for him to draw nigh to me? Then where was he? So my question is, when we draw nigh to him, he draws nigh to us. But here we find that Asa is getting this prophetic word. He said, if you, if you seek me, you'll find me. But if you forsake me, I'll forsake you. For a long time, everyone say a long time. <clears throat> a long time Israel had been without the true God. That meant that there were false gods. Without a teaching priest and without the law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. Notice verse 5. In those days there was no peace. In those days there was no peace. To, to the one who went out nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the land. Notice what it says here. In those days, there was no peace. What does it mean to be without peace? You can't even experience any sense of rest in your own life. There's no peace. There's no communication. <clears throat> there's no relationship. There's turmoil. In those days, there was no peace. How many of you know it's pretty sad when you're in a place where there's just turmoil all the time? But you know what's even worse? Is when you get used to it. When you get used to the enemy killing, stealing, plundering, and robbing you blind, and you just come to accept it. How many of you know there's something really wrong with that? You see, people that care fight. Everyone say fight. Paul says to fight the good fight. He didn't say picnic. He didn't say have a party. He said there's times where you're going to have to put on the whole armor of God and you're going to have to fight for what you believe in. You're going to have to fight for what you love. You're going to have to fight for what's valuable. Fighting is not just Arguing, but fighting, first of all, starts by discernment. Everyone say discernment. I've got to know who my enemy is. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Amen? I've got to stop looking at flesh and blood. I've got to start getting in the wrong battle with the wrong person. I'm going to start fighting. Here, Azariah comes to Asa and says, There's no peace but great turmoil to all the inhabitants of the land. Verse 6, And nation was destroyed by nation. And city by city, for God troubled them with every adversary. I want to just say this. I, I've talked to people, I'm sure you have. And one of the things in Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 28 is a powerful passage that deals with God's providence and blessing upon his people. If you read it, it says that if you will hearken to obey all these commandments 
then you shall be above only and not beneath. You will be the head and not the tail. Then he says you'll be blessed in the field and blessed in the street, the city. You'll be blessed in your basket and you'll be blessed with your herds and <clears throat> you'll be blessed with your crops and you'll be blessed here and you'll be blessed there and blessed for 11 verses. Blessing, 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 blessing. And all of these, I love the last part. It says, and all of these blessings will overtake you. Do you know what it means in the Hebrew to be overtaken? It literally means to literally be tackled. Tackle me, blessing. It literally means to be so bombarded with the blessing that you, all, you actually have to, God, s stop blessing me. I, I, I can't hail anymore. Can you imagine saying, that? God, thank you for blessing me, but enough. I'm drowning with too much blessing. That's what it means to be overwhelmed or overtaken with that kind of a situation. But here... <clears throat> Azariah gives Asa some more instruction, and he says this, And you, be strong, and don't let your hands be weak. Now, hands speaks of my activities. Hands speaks of my work. What's my work? The Bible says that Jesus saved us from dead works unto good works. What's, what's a good work? What does it mean? Good. Is it going to church more? No, that's going to church is important. But that's not the work he's talking about. The kind of work that he's referring to is my work and my I'm working on my relationship. I'm working on my integrity. Everyone say integrity. Do you know one of the reasons why nations fall apart? One of the first things that go in a, any nation that falls is integrity. And then we begin to live with a seared conscience. Then we begin to abuse our authority. We begin to tell people to stay out of my life. Shut up! That's a dangerous thing to say to people. Your business is my business. Especially in marriage. And even in a community, a church family. It is our business. Some people want, they don't want that kind of close proximity, but that's what, coven, that's what a covenant community involves, is communication. It involves recognizing here that there's a work to be done. It involves leadership. Everyone say leadership. Some of the most difficult things in my own life. I can say this, that there's been times where I wasn't always honest with my wife. How many of you know what marriage means? Marriage means everything is out in the open. Good preaching, Pastor Ray. There's no secrets. Why? I'm not saying everything's out in the open for everybody, but between my wife and I, there's a covenant. You may say, Pastor Ray, why are you preaching this? Because I want you healthy. I don't want there are any cracks in the wall. I don't want the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy anymore. How many of you are tired of the enemy beating you up? Stealing and killing your life. It's time to start fighting for what makes what matters. The devil wants you, let me tell you what the devil wants. The devil wants you to become so conditioned and accustomed to coming to church and hearing a message, and going through the motions, and pretending while you are like the frog in the kettle that slowly boils to death. You'll die. The Bible says that there comes a point where even the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, cannot even make headway into the mind of a person where they have embraced deception to such a degree where they no longer can hear the Holy Spirit. It's called a reprobate mind. Oh, I don't receive this, but this is condemnation. No. Let me tell you, how many here have ever gone to a doctor? How many of you ever told your doctor when he gave you bad news, I rebuke you, reprobate mind. I rebuke you, devil. I've done that a few times. 
I'd come home to my wife. I remember telling her a couple of years ago, I said, Carol, it's time to change doctors. She said, why? Well, he's, he's telling me everything I'm eating wrong. He's telling me I'm way overweight, and they even have the audacity to say I'm not going to make it to 70 years old. That's condemnation. It's time to change doctors. The guy actually cared about me. But you see, I had become conditioned into, with my preconception, I wanted a doctor to scratch my back and tell me, Ray, you're doing great, man. How about some more pain pills? Send you home feeling good. We want you to feel good. I know I'm killing you, but I want you to feel good for the moment. Anybody want to go back to that doctor? I'll give you his name. No. But see, that, that, that's not a doctor who practices healthy medicine. Jesus said that he was the great physician. Do you know that people that love you care enough about you they care enough about you, like Azariah the prophet, cared enough about Asa and the people of Israel to warn them. When John gave this prophetic word today about a frontal assault, I believe that. And I believe we need to have ears to hear. You may say, well, Pastor Ray, I'm an American. I'm an intelligent guy. I make good money. I, I live in a great neighborhood. I, the devil's not going to take me by surprise. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? That if it was possible in the last days that even the very elect will be deceived. Let no man deceive you. Now in the case of Asa, Notice what happens when he receives this word. First of all, he starts with this encouraging word, be strong, don't let your hands be weak, be a leader. And he says, for your work will be what? Rewarded. <clears throat> guess what? I built a new shed. And guess what? I've never been robbed since. <laughs> Praise God. I got a concrete floor. And you know what? When I built this shed, there's not one solitary window in the thing. I've got a four-foot steel door. It's called overbuilding. No one in the past ten years has ever tried. Even myself, I can't get in it. I've lost a key a few times. I can't even get in my own shed unless I take a saws on, cut a hole through the wall. I've lost a key. But here's the point. How many of you know it's good to have a key? If you're to build a shed and you're going to build a straw, make sure you have a key to get into the door. But in this case, you're going to be rewarded. And notice, and when Asa heard these words, he went back to playing football. Now, when he heard these words, he took courage and removed the idols. Everyone say, remove the idols. The idols from the land of Judah and Benjamin, from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim, and he restored the altar of the Lord. Two things happened. Removing the, well, what is an idol? An idol is anything that comes between you and the Lord. An idol is anything that your heart affections and your desires are stronger than your relationship to the will of God. An idol isn't just some wooden object. An idol can be a relationship. An idol can be drug addiction. It can be alcohol. Idolatry can be the worship of self. Do you know you can put self where you have this feeling of entitlement? I am entitled to do what I want and when I want to. That's idolatry. That's idolatry. No one will tell me what to do. That's idolatry. I'll worship God as I want. I'll tithe how I want. I'll go to church where I, I'll do what I want. It's idolatry. 
There is a way that seems right unto man at the end there of his death. One of the ways you know that Jesus is truly Lord is when you surrender all. How many of you have heard of the song, I Surrender All? Can you imagine someone singing that song? I surrender some. I surrender some a little bit unto Thee. I surrender. I surrender some, but I'm going to keep all these things that belong to me. How many of you know God wants all of our secrets? He wants all of our idols. <clears throat> Years ago, I used to struggle quite a long time ago with an ongoing pornography addiction. It's idolatry. Not only is it an issue of idolatry, but it was destroying my brain. That's why we were doing life coaching on Monday nights. and We're helping men. It's one of the most intense discipleship programs because it's an intense battle. If you want to break addiction, you've got to get into the fight. It's not a picnic. You've got to confront some stuff. If I had pornography, I would not let football, I wouldn't let anything, bowling, anything, come between me and getting free from that addiction that will send you to hell. Oh, Pastor Ray, that's condemnation. I didn't write it. Jesus did Matthew 6. If you look upon a woman and you lust after your heart, he said, pluck out your right eye. How many of you know that's kind of desperate? He didn't say massage the eye. He didn't say close the eye. He said, pluck it out. Oh, Pastor Ray, this is too intense of a preaching message because hell is pretty desperate. Notice what, what he does. He removes the idols. You know, when you begin to remove idols, guess what? You're going to experience some pain. When I stopped drinking Coca, by the way, you know, I, I don't, this is not such an intent, but I, I used to have a love for Coca-Cola. When I stopped drinking Coca-Cola, my son was right, I went through body shock for two months. I mean, I was waking up in the middle of the night dreaming about Coke. I mean, I remember pouring that Coca-Cola over those ice cubes and the fizzies were going. I dreamt about it, and Carol said, you really got a problem, right? Yeah, but it's just Coca-Cola. How can that be bad? But I was killing myself, especially down here. Man alive, one of our sisters in the church here sent me a picture, and I was sitting here on the stairs, and I looked like a hemoth beached whale. It was horrible, and I couldn't believe. My cheeks were fat, my neck was fat, everything was round. But it was not healthy round. It was a sick roundness because I was drinking four, five, six cans of Coke. It was an idol. You know what I was doing? I was turning Coke. Oh, it wasn't horrible drugs. It wasn't horrible other things. I was drinking Coke because I thought that was okay while I destroyed my body. But it was idolatry because I was using that to just medicate my anxiety. How many believe God wants to bring wholeness, spirit, soul, and body in all your areas of your life? But he said this, and so he restored the altar. The second thing, he removes the altar. He restores the altar of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. That means that he restored prayer. Everyone say prayer. He returned to worship. All of a sudden, he restored the altar. The altar was a place. An altar is a place that's established as an on going memorial and a place in the routine of my life. Now we don't need to re rebuild old rock wooden altars like they did in the old covenants, but I have an altar in my life every day. I build that altar by coming before the Lord and I offer to the Lord thanks and praise and worship to Him. That's an altar of prayer. But it's not about just praying but it's, an, it's a place of connection. It's a place where God visits and speaks to me. He talks to me. It's a place where there's communion. It's a place where there's a visitation. And it says, for they came, verse 9, over in great numbers from Israel when they saw how the Lord God was with them. Notice the, the outcome of it was God 
was, was witnessed among their neighbors. Can you imagine when people say, what has happened to you? God is with you. That's the witness of what happens. Verse 12, And they entered into the covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whatsoever, who would ever not seek the Lord God, they were to be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they took an oath before the Lord. One of the reasons they made such drastic measures like this is because they realized the high cost of not serving the Lord. One last text. I want you to jump over with me to 2 Corinthians 6. Notice what the apostle... This is New Covenant here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. This has to do with our sense of identity and our relationship and blessing. Again, notice what Paul is saying here. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 6 verse 11. Oh, Corinthians! We have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Everyone say affections. He said, we haven't restricted you. You've restricted yourself from your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as children... You be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? Now he's not suggesting that we cannot become a friend to sinners. But the idea of being in fellowship with sinners means that you will not participate in the activities that unbelievers participate. Why? Because my body is redeemed. My life and my body and my future belongs to Him. If you are truly born again this morning, you don't do what you want. You do what He wants. Because you and I belong to Him. I'm no longer my own. What comes in my mouth, what comes in my eye gate, what comes in my ear gate. You see the relationships I have. Now, there's a lot of ungodly sinner friends I have even now. There's neighbors. We love them, we honor them, we encourage them. But guess what? I don't participate in their activities. They'll ask me to, Carol and I, but we say, you know what? We'll, love, we'll come over, we'll, be, we'll love to be connected with you, but we're not going to be a participant in certain activities because our bodies belong to Jesus. And I'm not going to put my relationship with my wife in a dangerous situation as well. And Paul is dealing with this problem with the Corinthians. And what accord, verse 15, does Christ have with Baal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you have are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in them. And I will walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, what does it say right here? Everyone say it. Come out. Come out. Now he's not talking about coming away from our society. He's not suggesting that we are to isolate ourselves from our community. But he said, come out from participating in their kind of idolatrous practices. Because your body and your life belongs to the Lord. Come out and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He says, I want to bring cleansing to the conscience of my people. Yes. Maybe someone this morning said, Pastor Ray, my conscience is not clear. It's not been clear for a long time. Do you know God wants you to have a clean, clean conscience? He doesn't want you tormented with a guilty conscience any longer. Well, I thought the love of God meant that grace just goes everywhere. Yes, it does. But you know why God loves you so much? He loves you not to only save you, but to transform you. He loves you enough not to leave you where you're at and die in your sin. And so Paul here says, this is the responsibility, by the way, of the believer. Come out, be separate, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will receive you. 
Notice what he's saying. What he's really saying here is, I will bless your life. How many of you want the blessing of the Lord on you? He said, come out, be separate. In other words, consecrate yourself as holy to the Lord. You know, we talk about love a lot. We talk about grace a lot. We talk about God's mercy. We've spoken much over this. But the Lord said, today, Ray, you're to teach on the fear of the Lord. You're to teach on my people are to be clean, they're to be holy, and they're not to touch or handle the unclean thing, and I will receive them. Now you're looking at a guy, I have touched the unclean thing in my life. There's been times where I've lied, I've seen porn. I, one time I was addicted years ago to uh, pills, and every single one of those things, God has cleansed me from it. And he didn't cleanse me just so that I could preach mercy. No, he said you to preach the grace of God mixed with the righteousness of God. There's a responsibility I have not. I'm to watch what I, I, I I'm, I'm, to, I'm to be careful what I watch. I'm to be careful with relationships, with people I run with. If you're running around people that are bitter and angry at God and at the church, and you're running around and you don't think that won't affect you, it will affect you. If you're having problems with a spouse and you're running around people that are so-called friends that are bad-mouthing their husband or bad-mouthing their, their uh, wife and you're running and, they call, and you call them friends, you better run as fast as you can because it will affect your marriage. Good preaching. You may say, well, Pastor Ray, what does this have to do? It has everything to do with building a church that Jesus is coming for. And that's a church without spot or wrinkle. Today, the Lord spoke to my heart, said, there's somebody here that is in an adulterous affair. I don't know who, but there's an adulterous affair, and whatever that is, unless you cut that off, the future does not look bright. God loves you enough to warn you, and he wants those relations. By the way, an adulterous affair doesn't mean you're just having sex with somebody. You can have an online affair that is just as much adultery. God wants us to come out be separate and be set aside for Him, for His glory. Amen? Let's bow our heads. I know that the blessing of the Lord rests upon those who love Him. And those, Paul says, those who work righteousness. Maybe you might say, every head bowed, every head bowed. I don't want anyone looking around. You may say, Pastor Ray, I know there's some things the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about, and He wants my heart and my life to be right, and I know that there's areas in my life that are not right. And I know this word was for me. I know this. Let me tell you what John said this morning. You won't, you won't last a minute with this demonic, based on Revelation 13, the whole message in itself. There's going to be a spirit of deception, the Bible says, will cover the face of the earth. Will come out of the sea and upon the dry land, and the deception will cover as a gross darkness that covers the earth. But the Bible says we're to arise and shine for our light has come. God is a God of mercy. When we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. He's faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful to renew our minds and set us on a path of blessing. But if I make light and I just become casual about sin, then I want to just say that the Lord warns you today. The Lord warns you because He loves you. He loves you enough to send prophets in ministry because He loves you. The Bible says He would not that anyone would perish, but all would come to repentance. Maybe that's you this morning. You, you need cleansing and healing, and you know there's a need for separation from something that you become attached to. It may be some form of idolatry. Would you raise your hand, stick it down. I'm going to pray for you right now. In Jesus' name. Okay, I see your hands. Anyone else? You can put your hands down when you're done. Okay, I see your hands. Okay, I see your hands. Okay, the Holy Spirit here is to bring healing and restoration. The Bible says, he who covers his sin shall not prosper. 
He who covers his sin will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes shall have mercy. I want mercy. I do not want to cover my sin. Never. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? Let's stand to our feet. <clears throat> I really believe God is saying, Ray, as He's talking to all of us actually, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, you are my bride. And you, we've been espoused to Jesus as a chaste virgin. And we are to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I can be around the world, but I don't participate with what the world does. I don't have to get involved in their activities. Today, everybody's into recreational sex, recreational drugs, recreational clubs, recreational, and they're being duped and they're being baited by Satan. And they're becoming addicted to a way of life they do not know how to get out of. And God wants to set us free. Amen? Amen. Father, I just pray right now for those whose hands were raised. Lord, that was an act of faith. It was an act of faith and it was an act of response to the Holy Spirit as you're speaking to our hearts. I'm asking you right now, Lord, that you would just cover them with mercy. Lord, we ask you right now that your compassion will overflow on their lives and you would draw them, Lord, according to your mercy and your goodness. Lord, we need to know that there's a purpose why Jesus went to the cross. Not just to forgive us, but to transform us. And Lord, we want to become not hearers only, but doers and followers of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that we will go with an understanding like Asa in 2 Chronicles, when he destroyed the idols and he rebuilt and returned to worship. Lord, you caused your presence and blessing to rest upon the house of Asa during his life. Lord, I pray right now that we would walk in the same faithfulness that Asa, the king of Judah, did. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, turn to someone and say, you're righteous in Jesus' name. There's a righteousness on you in Jesus' name. God bless. Don't forget Legend Oaks at 3 o'clock this afternoon.